Wow, such great energy here in this room. We feel so much love overflowing from every direction, yeah? I want to wish everyone this peace of Christ that we feel, all the joy that can overflow to each one of our hearts, because it really is a joyful moment to come together here as friends and to see so many faces again, friends that live apart, but we feel we're connected in spirit. Maybe when we go to sleep, we meet up and and do some work and learn some new lessons. And so it's such a beautiful uh, chance to come back to this room. When I first was here, it was almost 10 years ago wow. or nine years ago. And we in the Spiritist Movement of the United States owe a great tribute to the Spiritist Society of Baltimore because you guys have been one of the first pioneers in blazing a trail for the English language dissemination of Spiritism. It's because of the inspiration of the directors here, including Vanessa, who's no longer here. She's opening other centers in other places and starting other points of light, that many centers in other places in the country have decided to form smaller groups to dedicate themselves in English, including the Inner Enlightenment Spiritist Society, which is the center I am a part of in New York, which celebrates 10 years of opening its doors next month. And it was an inspiration of a few Brazilians with broken English who were courageous and had enough faith to open a center after the gathering that was hosted here in Baltimore in order to disseminate the Spiritism in the English language, which was the first symposium and led the way to the future symposiums. And today we have an annual event that brings together people from all over the continent and each year, each year's edition just grows more and more. So it's wonderful to be back here. Thank you for all the love that I receive from both spheres of life. This room feels like it's electric, crackling with wonderful energies. And as Leo said, this topic of the Sermon of the Mount, people have spent an entire lifetime studying, scholars dedicating themselves dissecting every aspect of it. So I don't want to have any pretenses that I have anywhere near the final word on the Sermon of the Mountain. I'm merely offering a reflection, a angle of it, aided by my studies in Spiritism. And what we're going to do today is incorporate the studies with a little bit of music. I joke that people invite me to go to Spiritist houses because of the violin. So I merely just carry the violin, I show up, I play. But really, the star of the night is sitting right there, it's the violin. So we're going to have it, don't worry, it's coming up. In the meantime, please exercise your patience and tolerance by putting up with what I say. <laughs> so the Sermon of the Mount is one of the most beautiful and profound passages in all of Jesus' teachings. It's so pivotal that the spirits in the codification dedicate several chapters of the gospel according to spiritism just with the titles blessed are the afflicted blessed are the pure of heart it's it's that pivotal and so the main um, part of the sermon of the mountain reflection i would like to offer for us to have today is based on the spiritist doctrine specifically by a book, a set of books called The Wisdom of the Gospel, which does not have a translation to English yet. It's called Sa Sabedoria do Evangelho. The author is Carlos Torres Pastorino. Who is familiar with Carlos Torres Pastorino? Raise your hand. Who is Brazilian here that uh, is familiar with a tiny little blue book called Minutos de Sabedoria, or Minutes of Wisdom? It's a similar book to Happy Life, that this gentleman wrote and became a bestseller in Brazil and it's a staple of every pharmacy, newsstand, dry cleaner, bakery, they will have the little book there. And it's almost like a spiritual ER, emergency support, because the way he talks is very universalist, very secular and at the same time deeply consoling. Now, people who know of Pastorino only of that book don't realize that he is an eminent scholar who was fluent in Greek, Coptic, Aramaic, Hebrew, thank you, there it is, and Latin. And Pastorino was actually a high-ranking uh, bishop in the Vatican. So he had access to all of the books in the Vatican library. 
And throughout his life, he was a deep stu stu student of the Gospels. And he was tasked with a mission to go to Brazil in order to debunk Spiritism. Imagine, Brazil was the largest Catholic country at the time. I don't know if by population it still may be. No, right? It's the second largest. But at the time it was the first. And Spiritism was spreading like wildfire. So the church looked at Spiritism as a very big threat. So they wanted to big, put the best man for the job to go to Brazil and debunk it. In order for him to debunk it, he would have to get to know it. So he goes to Brazil and he begins to read the Spirit's book and the Medium's book and he starts to have a struggle, an inner struggle. Because he starts to say to himself, wow, this makes a lot of sense. This is very rational. But he continues and then he starts to see the Spiritist community centers, the amount of charitable work for the homeless, for the orphans. And he starts to struggle with it. So how can I say this is the work of the devil? How can I struggle with this? The straw that broke his camel's back was when Mahatma Gandhi was invited to have an audience with the Pope in the Vatican. And they had requested for protocol that Gandhi would show up in a suit. Pastorino thought to himself, wow, if Jesus were to come today to visit the Pope, would they require him to wear a suit? That shook him and he, and he broke from the church and became an eminent scholar of Spiritism, wrote many books. He has already disincarnated and he actually has channeled one book through Givaldo Franco as a spirit called Impermanence and Imponderability. Title is in Portuguese, not available in English yet. So I have a profound admiration for this man because in this incredible eight volume book called The Wisdom of the Gospel. He goes through the whole four Gospels and he examines the cultural context of each word, the translation in Greek and what it meant for the people at the time. And with the key of understanding that Spiritism provides, he opens up a whole new world of understanding. So I would like to offer some of the insights that he shared on the Sermon of the Mountain. And we'll have time to ask questions, to agree, to disagree. The more open and the more egalitarian this is, the better because there are no teachers, no students. We're all learning, all apprentices here together. So in order for us to prepare mentally for it and emotionally, I wanted to read this passage by Jesus when he's at the lake with his apostles and there are many children running around, being children, being joyful. And he's smiling, he's there with them and the apostles get very frazzled about her and they start to reprimand the kids for being too loud and too uh, energetic. And he says, don't do that. Let the children, let the little children come to me. And he says, I tell you, if you do not convert, if you do not turn and become like them, you will not receive the kingdom of heaven. Truly I say to you, who the, whoever does not receive the kingdom of heaven like a child, will not enter into it. What does he mean? Receive the kingdom of heaven like a child. It's to have that innocence, that simplicity, to be able to see joy, purity in everything and everyone. That spontaneity. That is actually very freeing. Emmanuel in the book, Paul and Stephen, makes references all the time throughout the book when he mentions the dialogues that they're having and he says they were going to implement the freedom of the gospel, the freedom of the gospel, the freeing gospel. It's always tied to liberation, to freedom, which I think is a very empowering concept. And this is the mountain that we wish to climb when we undertake the work. So the Sermon of the Mount has a symbolic mountain one that we all climb uphill because it's an effort. And the sermon is nothing more than a pathway to guide us up the mountain. So when we look at an image like this, we connect emotionally with it. The joy of the master, smiling, playing with the kids, having that purity, that simplicity. How can we approach these sacred texts, these beautiful teachings, with that state of mind and state of heart. If we do that, we're able to better assimilate and better enjoy it. This is another beautiful symbol. 
Christ being born in the manger. I want us to remember this visual because it will come in handy as we go through the different Beatitudes in the sermon. This is a very beautiful and powerful image. The Christ of the earth, the spirit that was entrusted by God to oversee the entire creation and spiritual evolution of this planet. When it comes time for himself to exemplify the lessons, he chooses to reincarnate and be born in a very humble manger. That alone is the example of humility that starts the Sermon of the Mountain, which we're going to see. What's very beautiful, as you can see, is that you have a Christ child born surrounded by what? Animals. What is the animal? How are the animals in this picture like? How, are, how is their state of being in this picture? They are appeased. They are domesticated. Even the word domesticated comes from the Latin domine. Domine is God. So when we are able to domesticate our own inner beasts, inner animals, we can finally allow room for the inner Christ to be born in the center of our beings. That's for, that for me is what this image represents. And we will see that as we examine the layers of the Sermon of the Mount, this is the type of work that Christ is going to invite us to do in the depths of our hearts. It's an internal journey first. After we complete a certain threshold of the internal journey, then we are equipped to go out into the world. So, as we saw the photo of Christ being joyful, and as we see this photo of Christ in the center, surrounded by the appeased animals of our personalities, let us allow us ourselves to be carried by the music and feel the joy of Christ as Johann Sebastian Bach once had. And I'm going to ask for a little bit of assistance from my friend Leo, if you don't mind. Or actually, it's going to be too complicated. I'll just put all the lyrics here, and then we'll play the music. I know I'll play, but I just wanted to show, show the... Um, I will ask you to press play for me in my phone. Uh, here we go. So, let me just put this here. So, this is by Johann Sebastian Bach. You know the music. You'll definitely recognize the melody. It's called Jesus, Joy of Man's Desiring. Can you guys all see the screen there? You're good? <laughs> okay. Just to make, make sure this guy is working. Battery 100%. 100%. You want batteries around 100% here? Let's see. Yes, it is. Okay. So, just get my violin ready. I will. Daniel, the microphone all good? Won't get in the way here? So, don't focus just on the lyrics that Bach con uh, composed, but the flow of the melody is that childlike joy free playfulness innocence also that's the core of Bach's inspiration for this song so
Thank you. That's the next song. And is, aren't the words so beautiful too? Okay. I think with that preparation, we... Sure? Oh, sure. Yes, the lyrics. Here we go. That's the translation to English. And that is a painting by the very precocious young Akiana, who is a spirit of much light and beauty, who paints some breathtaking paintings. Are we ready to climb this mountain? So both Matthew and Luke uh, wrote the Sermon of the Mountain. And they say that it was a huge crowd that was gathered. So Christ goes up a little bit on the mountain in order to be able to be seen by everybody. What's very beautiful is that the preparation for his speech is that he sits down and then opens his mouth and begins to speak. It was traditional for the rabbis and the doctors of the law when they wanted to expand on a topic for a long period of time, they would sit down. So this is a symbolic part too for Jesus sitting down and preparing himself to give these teachings. And the, the Beatitudes of the Sermon of the Mountain are nine, but remember I'm giving you the interpretation of Pastorino. And he says that the first seven are connected for the program of spiritualization, for the climbing of the mountain. Whereas the last two, which we're going to see, are merely external consequences of what happens when we interact with the world once we have achieved and mastered these virtues of the first seven Beatitudes. Now it's important to remember that they don't necessarily mean that you first have to acquire the second in order to reach the third. You don't have to master the third in order to get to the fourth. We're just putting them in the order that he spoke so that we can have a, a, a sequence and study them one by one. But in no way, shape, or form do they necessarily mean that you can only get to the fourth once you've mastered the first three. Is that clear? Okay. Having said that, though, there is a general pattern of growth and building up on one after the other. The first four we're going to attempt to do today is have the reflection on the first four, then have a break, little Q&A, little reflections on, and then conclude with the last three. The reason for that is that you'll notice that the first four refer specifically and exclusively to the internal inner journey, interaction with ourselves. When we start seeing the 5th, 6th, and 7th, you begin to interact with the outside world. And Pastorino says that that's an important break. Almost like the apprentice has the preparation with himself. When he's finally ready, then the work appears for him and he goes out into the world to be an extension of those blessings to other people. And that's the same idea here. So we're going to go one by one. And please, if you have any questions, we're going to have the Q&A in the end, but if there's something burning in your mind, feel free to, to, to raise. We're a small enough of a group that's intimate to have a, a fraternal conversation going. So the very first one. Who wants to read? Oh, we need the mic. It's just very simple, quick. There we go. Blessed, it's ready? It's ready. Blessed are the poor in the spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Thank you. Now you'll see that every slide, there's a passage from the Our Father prayer. It's incredible what Pastorino offers as a comparative analysis of the Beatitudes side by side with each passage of the Our Father prayer. And he mentions that each part of the Our Father prayer goes along with one of these seven Beatitudes. So I put them together for us to examine. And really, you don't have to accept this, but you'll see that it makes a lot of sense. And this is in no way, shape, or form meant for us to have, like I said, a final say on this. This is just another study of it, an analysis of it. So 
just like we have the seven main centers of force, there are the seven Beatitudes, and he compares them side by side with the Our Father prayer. Except that, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, is the first Beatitude. And deliver us from evil is the last part of the Our Father prayer. So they intersect in reverse. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, why did I put this photo here for the first one? This is in Egypt. This is the Nile River. The Nile River flooded every season, right? And when the waters receded, agriculture was cultivated. And what was the reason that the fertile, the soil was so fertile? because it would leave behind, after the waters had flooded and receded, it would leave behind something called hummus or hummus, which is delicious food with chickpeas, but is also the very fertile, muddy soil that they would leave behind. Now, it just so happens that the word humility also comes from the same root, hummus. So, if we can cultivate an attitude of humility the whole time, then our inner heart is like that fertile soil. And when that happens, we are teachable, we are receptive, we are of service to others. It's so much easier for us to be able to assimilate these teachings. The spirits in the codification, they say in the spirits book, that what are the two greatest obstacles to our progress? Pride, Pride and selfishness. Pride, as the spirits say in another question, blinds us. When we're acting from a place of pride and ego, we don't see our own deficiencies. We, we refuse to it. If we're acting in a way that just blinds us from it. So the opposite of pride is the humility, is to have a transparency about ourselves and recognize where do I need to work on. And I believe is Wayne Dyer, who, and I may be wrong, please correct me if I'm wrong, that says that the word ego stands for edging God out. When we are operating in ego, we're edging God out. We don't let God, the inner Christ, be born in the manger of our hearts because the animals around us are acting wild. They're taking over the pride, the vanity, the lust, the gluttony, and on and on and on. So to start the mountain journey, we are poor in spirit. We allow ourselves to be humble. And Pastorino says that the word blessed in the sermon really means fortunate. Happy are those, fortunate are those that are poor in spirit. Blessed are those is another way of saying fortunate are those. Lucky, so to speak. Not that they are special or separate, but they are fortunate because all of us are going to get there eventually. So to be able to be poor in spirit is to cultivate this inner humus, the inner humility. And Pastorino also says that the way that poor in spirit is translated in Greek, is not translated, written in the original Greek, is, gives the connotation of a beggar of the spirit. So when we see a person that's doing begging, they're being beggars, they're desperately imploring for something, for alms. That attitude of being a beggar of the spirit is what allows us to give room for our spirit over the needs of our body. Which is why it says, deliver us from evil. We study spiritism enough to understand that no one is downright evil forever. And that the word evil is nothing more than a symbol for anything that is in opposition to our best interests of our spirit's growth. So in that way, matter the material world works in opposition if we choose to become attached to our material needs and wants. Would you agree with me? This is a school, this is a hospital, this is a place of learning that's sacred. But if we allow ourselves to be attached to it and we let the op opposing forces overcome the strength of our spirit, then we fall into the temptation. That's why he says, deliver us from the evil. Rescue us from these material attachments and those material tendencies that may keep our spirits captive. 
So, to be poor in spirit, to be humble, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And where is the kingdom of heaven, by the way? Is there an address? Is there a GPS location for it? Is up there? Is it just up there? It's everywhere, and it's right here, and it's right now, right? So, we don't have to wait to let the physical body expire to finally enter the kingdom of heaven. All we need to do is cultivate the attitude of humility, and we are there already. We're going to use a few parts of Paul's um, reading. Anybody like to read? Oh, question. Okay. It's on. It's on. I was raised Catholic, so I know I know those beatitudes automatically. But now that I think like a spiritist, I'm reading it differently, and now it doesn't make as much sense to me because I would change poor to rich. A right. person who is rich in spirit enters the kingdom of God. Now, if I translate it with your help to begging for more spirit in my life, but that still doesn't make sense to me. Can you see where I'm stuck I now? totally get what you're saying. when I just did it right <laughs> It, it is, it can be a little bit of a mind twister. It, it sort of counterintuitive. Well, poor in spirit, but those that are more filled with the spirit, then they should be rich in spirit. What he's describing in this sermon, I believe, is that not rich with our personalities, not rich with our egos, but so humble and so deprived of those attachments that we let the simplicity of our spirit, which is immortal, the individuality that is immortal, speak through us and we can only allow them to speak when we are poor so to speak in that personality it, it, we're not attached to our pride attached to our egos yeah i know it, it can still be a little bit confusing it is more than an act it's more than an, an attitude than a quality of the spirit it's an attitude of the spirit to be humble it's not the quality of the spirit this quality of the spirit is to be rich that's the way I, that's the way I understand them, sorry. Yeah. And it's, it's, the same, it's the same part when Christ says it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than the rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And people automatically saying, okay, rich people are going to hell. He never said that. Attachment to material possessions will leave our spirits glued to the planet Earth, earthbound. If we are detached from it, we can be billionaires in our bank account. But if we're detached, the physical body dies, spirit soars. The spirit soars. So it's all about attachment to that. Maybe it'll shed light later, but it's great that we have questions. I love when we can have an interactive conversation about it. The second one, blessed are the afflicted, for they will be comforted. Some translations in English also say, blessed are those that mourn. It all depends on what English translation we see. I put both because the explanation he gives is really of a mourning. What happens when we go through mourning? We're feeling like we're missing somebody that is no longer with us. So it's a pain of the separation, right? Blessed are those, or fortunate that are those that are suffering through that affliction, that type of pain, that type of mourning, the grieving, for they will be comforted. What do we think that he's describing here? Now, we can look at Paul of Tarsus as an example. I picked this very cool cartoon off of Google which is the moment when he's on his way to Damascus to persecute the nascent Christians there. And as he's in the desert on his horse with the Roman legions, he suddenly falls from his horse because he sees this, sees this blinding light and Christ materializes to him and says in a very compassionate way, Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? This is a moment when the old man inside of Paul comes in direct clash with the new man that's going to be born in him. But in order for that to occur, he needs to fall off his horse. And he does fall to the ground. 
And the Romans, the legions that are there, they don't understand what's going on because he's on the floor crying and weeping. And they're all looking at each other, what is wrong with this man? Now, this is a symbol for us as well. Remember the manger and the animals around? In order to, for us not to let the animals of our personality and our egos drive us, but instead let the wisdom of our spirit take charge, we need to dismount our horse. We need to, in a way, lower ourselves to the ground with that sense of humility in order to be receptive and of service. How can we be of service to others when there's so much ego, there's so much um, presumptuous inside of us? There's no room for inspiration there. There's only my ego, my personality, my lecture, my center, right? My house, my wife, my children, my job. So to have the affliction, let us not fall into temptation. It's that part in the Our Father prayer. When Christ recommends us to connect with God through this prayer, the Our Father prayer, He's not saying let us not come across any temptation in that prayer. We're going to have temptations. We're going to face them. It's part of our educational process. We need to face them. But let us not fall. Let us not succumb. So the process of pain and affliction is that disconnection from the old man and the things that give life to the old man. Saul, the doctor of the law, filled with pride, filled with his ambitions of conquest and power and domination of the Jewish people and being in a position of great prominence in order to expound on the virtues of the Jewish race of the time. That was the old man, Saul. And here in this part of the book, we see the beginning of the new man. But the struggle takes many years in Paul's life. And for us, as eternal spirits, immortal spirits. Takes many years, sometimes takes a few reincarnations. And throughout the process, especially in the beginning, there will be an affliction, there will be a pain. So we ask that we don't fall into the old temptations, the things that our spirits used to carry out, what Kardec calls the conditioned reflexes, the things that we are used to. So Yazgu comes to me and insults me, my reaction is my blood boils and I go after her. Because I used to do that. Many, many lives I did that. It was part of our modus operandi here. Which is one of the reasons why the spirits say that the majority of us, when we return to the spirit realm, we don't necessarily remember more than three lives. Because if we want to go further, further back, and by the way, this is not a rule, this is just one of the things that they say as a guideline. Because if we start going back a lot, we'll get really, really traumatized. So, <laughs> to remember those things. So far, so good? Okay. Now, this is one of my favorites. The third one. And I got my little notes here just to make sure I'm not missing anything. Okay. Who would like to read? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit or possess the earth. Thank you. What's that? Forgive right. us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Thank you. Do we see how the two connect? The Our Father prayer passage can connect with that? How come forgiving and forgiveness can have anything to do with meekness and peace-loving. This part also is translated as blessed are the meek and the peace-loving, for they shall possess or shall inherit the earth. What's your name? Paula. Paula. Um, this one's beautiful. I find no difficulty understanding this one. To me, the opposite of meek is arrogant. The opposite of meek is arrogant. They have trouble forgiving because usually it's all about me. Yeah, true. That's a good insight. So to be meek and peace-loving, remember the animals in the manger? How can we achieve emotional self-control, emotional autonomy, where 
no matter what's happening out there or no matter who is around us, I don't lose my inner peace. The concept of peace is such a deep concept that Christ gave to us in so many passages. When he first resurrects and appears to the disciples in Peter's house, what is the first thing that comes from his mouth that he says to his disciples? Peace be with you. I leave you my peace. This concept of peace is so beautiful. And I love in Portuguese, because it comes to Latin, the word patience is the same as pacem, which is peace. So peace and patience are directly related. Who here is a patient person? Raise your hand. I am far from being a patient person. I am struggling a lot with this sermon. I'm here with you guys, struggling in every beatitude as well. And patience is something I need to learn on my own. Irritability, how we snap and how we react when people say something we don't like. We get impatient, we get, and I live in New York City, so it's even more, everybody is walking impatient. Everybody is walking like they don't wanna waste time. How do we allow ourselves not to be sucked into this turbulence and maintain our inner peace? Well, we can still be very productive, do a lot of things in one day, but do them with that serenity, right? It's a challenge, but fortunate are those that are able to master that. Possessing and inheriting the earth is another insight that I learned from Sergio, Fil Sergio Lopes. From Sergio Lopes from the south of Brazil. He wrote a whole book on the Sermon of the Mountain and he gives a lecture on the Sermon of the Mountain. And I read his lecture and I picked this insight from him. To possess the earth is two meanings. One, Christ is making a prediction about the future. The planet earth, when it becomes a planet of regeneration, will be a planet where the meek and peace-loving will reside. They will inherit the earth. They will possess the earth. They will dominate the earth in a way where they'll be in charge. Is that the case today? No. But it is something for us not to be distraught, not to be sad, not to be depressed or anxious when we watch the news, when we consume the news, which is very toxic which is fear, 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 fear. So as a reminder for all of us that are studying Spiritism, to read those things, but also be a distant observer at the same time, seeing the process unfold from a higher vantage point and not get caught into the anxiety of the times because scandals are necessary, as Christ says. And in the process, we will reflect by witnessing things. We're going to reflect on what's truly right, what's truly moral, what's truly pure in our hearts, and begin to shift values. Slowly, we're all going to get there. But this is an internal journey. It has nothing to do with people out there, right? The first four Beatitudes specifically are dealing just with ourselves, our inner self, no one else. So to be meek and peace-loving is not only the future of this planet, but those that are meek and peace-loving will inherit and possess this earth. We'll have total dominion, total control, total sovereignty over this. Where do the emotions come from? Where do the reactions come from? Oh, here. To be able to master that, though, requires us to practice forgiveness, unconditionally forgiveness. Now, it's easier said than done, right? And in the Our Father prayer, Pastorino offers us an insight into the word, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Am I okay? You guys hear any feedback? Okay. Think, he says, think of the concept of disconnect. Disconnect us from our trespasses, as we wish to disconnect those who trespass against us. Why is that? When we don't forgive, and it doesn't mean a sworn enemy, because we have evolved to the point where we have, I don't like that person. So it's, it's less like he's a, my sworn enemy, I'm gonna go and burn down his village. 
No, it's more subtle, it's more nuanced. But we keep cultivating the grievance. We keep cultivating remembering what happened. And we keep playing it out all the time. These thoughts are being emanated. They're hitting the target. The target is the person, the victim, whether they know it or not. Whether they even feel insulted by us, because a lot of the times, they don't even know. Somebody insulted us, we harbored that hate against them, we don't forgive them. They don't even realize that they had hurt us. So to be able to disconnect us from them is to leave them at peace, not wish them harm. When Christ says, love your enemies, he doesn't mean take them with you and cuddle like a baby. And No, this, that doesn't make sense. He's, as Kardec says, the heart beats different when we are faced with an enemy as the heart beats when we are with somebody that we love, that we trust. So that makes perfect sense. But to be able to fully disconnect from every single person and every single grievance that they have done to me is to be at peace myself. Because nothing is connecting me with them or with the situation. Because there's nothing connecting me with them or the situation, there's nothing that's igniting or causing sparks in my heart that's going to make us feel any jittery. So the lake has no ripples. When it doesn't have any ripples, it has full peace. And this is when we begin to let the new man create more territory here, occupy more space inside of us. And more, more and more the new man starts to take over the old man. We begin to appease the heart. We begin to create, have that emotional self-control and really master the peace to be able to be an instrument. As this whole process here is being an instrument. In the part of Paul and Stephen, in the very end, and, um, uh, yes, it's Paul talking about God and his co-workers. And Andrea Luis talks about that. We are co-workers. Co is with who? With God. We are co-creating with God, for God, in God, for ourselves. To be a co-creator with God requires that this is a hospitable soil, fertile, humus, humble, and at the same time peaceful enough where the spirits can use and operate. Imagine if the violin was shaking, going up and down, the strings were popping. I wouldn't be able to play it. It needs to be receptive, it needs to be docile. So in order for that to not have huge oscillations, we need to practice being meek and peace-loving. And it ties with forgiving our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Wow. How are you feeling about it so far? Questions? Comments? Okay. Shall we keep climbing? <laughs> Put on your oxygen masks? No. We can all access. Who would like to read that one for us? Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot something very cool to, talk, to tell you. That's why I got my little notes here. So who is familiar with the book Jesus in the Home? 50 amazing stories that Christ tells his disciples in order to illustrate some deep lessons. Who's, who remembers of the passage in that book called The Four Tests? The Four Tests, remember? It ties exactly about this, emotional self-control, emotional autonomy, being fully peaceful. So there was a man in a village, and I'm paraphrasing here, so bear with me. I'll get the essential of the teaching. I don't remember exactly how it goes, but in a nutshell, there was a man in a village that everybody admired for being very devout, for being very holy. Everybody loved the man, and they wanted the man to go back to heaven. So they were asking the angels and praying, you need to take this man from our village and go to heaven because he's so divine, he's so sublime, he's such a person that does good, he's incredible. Everybody admired the man. So the prayers reached heaven. And so the Lord answered the prayers and said, okay, well, let's look into this case. Let's send the four angels down to the man in order for us to determine if he's ready for heaven. So the four tests are the four angels. And Christ says that 
in this kind of test, the first angel that always comes is the angel of want. So suddenly the man was faced with all kinds of privations. His, he lost his fortune. He started having issues with jobs. All kinds of wants dominated his life. All lacks began to assault him from every part. And the man stayed the course. He kept his faith. He kept his enthusiasm, his courage. He kept prayer, kept devout, kept doing his job. So he passed that first test. He was able to overcome the wants, the lacks. The second angel, the second test then comes. Wealth. So he was showered with fortunes, fortunes. And what did he do with it? He was able to distribute them in a way to give jobs to people, to provide employment. He was teaching them with his leadership. So he overcame wealth. He didn't let wealth overcome him. So he passed. Third one, which was, third test, power. Now, that's a really tough one, power. He was given positions of great responsibility, prominence, authority, and he uses it to educate everybody, to inspire people, to gather groups to do constructive work. He used power so well, so he passes. At this point, are you reading the book? I'm going, wow, so he's ready for heaven. Send a man already, right? And then the fourth test, it was so, it was totally like blindsided me. Anger. So comes the angel of anger. And in a very peculiar moment, when he's with some of his employees, the angel uses one of those individuals who was a little more receptive, a little more disconnected, and used to bring up something that was very embarrassing, very private, very delicate. What happens? His blood boils. He has a volcanic eruption. He begins to lash out at the man, lash out at his family. It takes him days to recover his emotional autonomy. And then Christ says, but by then it was too late. He lost the fruits of his labor. So he wasn't taken to heaven. He wasn't yet ready. And I think the Sermon of the Mountain is a reflection of how deep our inner world is, how profoundly complex it is, and how much work we want to do inside of ourselves. Because we oftentimes are not aware of our own reactions until we are faced with certain situations. And we look at people, we go, oh, I would never do that if I were in their position. We don't know. Maybe we've been there before and perhaps we may be there one, in one day. So that's why the purpose of reincarnating in a planet like this is to teach us through experience. Allow us to go through very diverse situations to know ourselves better when we go through those moments, when our buttons are being pressed, when our triggers are being shaken. So I wanted to offer this as a reflection for the blessed are the meek for they shall possess the earth so that we can really maintain that precious peace no matter what's happening in our lives with our friends cultivate that inner peace we're going to see why this is so important are we good on time okay we're going to see how precious how important this part of the peace is as we go later in another beatitude that has everything to do with peace as well Blessed are those who hunger. Oh, wants to read. Sorry, sorry. I'll read. Kirsten. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And in the Our Father. Give us this day our daily bread. Thank you. So let's remember Paul again. After Paul has his moment in Damascus, he becomes blind. He's healed by Ananias. The one man he was going to kill is the instrument of curing his blindness. Paul then has a long period of time, three years I believe, where he's in the middle of an oasis in the desert, just weaving, 
with a very lovely couple, husband and wife, who flees Jerusalem because they were being persecuted by Paul's edicts. So it's just the three of them in the middle of an oasis. And all they do is talk about the parchments of the gospel and examine. And Paul, for three years, goes to many moments of weeping, of crying, of cleaning, of removing those inner layers. And the whole time, Paul keeps a secret to himself. He doesn't share until the very end that he's actually Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor who was after them. Now, I, I mention this part because of the levels of preparation that this spirit under, underwent, has undergone, I don't know how it goes, went through in that lifetime in order to begin his ministry. Christ himself would spend some time in the desert, would spend 32 years of his life in preparation as well in order to begin his ministry here in earnest. So when we see this part, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, perfection, for they will be filled. They're talking about this yearning, this desire that the Spirit has for righteousness. Now, this righteousness is a complicated word. So much so in the English language, people say self-righteous. That doesn't have a good connotation. Oh, that person is very self-righteous. What does that mean? They're self-righteous. Right. Always yeah. thinks they're right. <laughs> Things are perfect. In a way, it comes with arrogance, with being presumptuous, right? So even the word righteousness doesn't have a very comfortable ring depending on who you talk to. Many people that are atheists or are, don't belong to any religion or belief, sometimes they look at Christians as self-righteous because they think they know, they think they're going to be saved and everybody else is going to be condemned. And so it's that kind of a relationship that we have with the word that sometimes gets it complicated. And Pastorino has a great re reflection for it. Actually, the context of the way this was written in Greek means perfection. Now it begins to make sense when we hunger and thirst for perfection because righteousness is justice. There are other translations that instead of using the word righteousness, they use justice. Now it makes sense if you think about it. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, for what is fair, for what is moral, for what is right. For they will be filled. Give us this day our daily bread to nourish our spirits. But if we go further, and Pastorino makes this comment, if truly... Blessed are the hunger, those that are hunger and thirst for only righteousness, justice. Then the next beatitude is a contradiction of the, first, of the previous one. How can I be hungry and thirsting for justice and at the same time be merciful? To exercise mercy is to know what's right, what's wrong, what's just, what's unjust, but be able to toss all of that aside and out of compassion, be able to extend forgiveness, be able to extend clemency, regardless of what's just or of what's unjust, regardless of what's right and wrong. It goes beyond that. So when they say God is infinite love, infinite wisdom, and He's infinitely just, those are all concepts that we understand in Spiritism. But sometimes we forget that between the justice of the law of cause and effect of action and reaction, there's a huge chunk of mercy that we often neglect. When we look at so many parables in the gospel, like the parable of the prodigal son, when the young son takes the fortune of the father, give me your inheritance, father. The father didn't even die. And the son asks for the inheritance before he dies. I mean, that's a scandal. That's outrageous. The father gives the inheritance. The child squanders everything. And when the child comes back, after having fallen from his horse, after having come to his senses, having done a similar movement that Paul does at the gates of Damascus, learning, reflecting, and coming back with humility to ask the father, 
for a place in his house as an employee, as a servant. I'm not worthy to be called a child anymore. I want to be called an employee. He goes with that attitude of humility. Does the father operate from a place of justice, of righteous? What does the father do at that moment in the parable? He runs up to the son and he embraces him. He gives him the shoe, puts the ring. Come on, let's have a party. Zero condemnation. Zero punishment. Zero guilt tripping. So the merciful part is something for us to meditate on. That it's a compliment to how we should act to one another. And it actually provides greater understanding to this one when we analyze from a point of view of perfection that goes beyond just the justice, the righteousness, what's right, what's wrong. So to hunger and to thirst for that perfection is the perfection of our spirit. When Christ says, be perfect like your Father in heaven is perfect, it's that ascension, that spiritual evolution that we yearn for. To be able to hunger and thirst for that is to go through the afflictions, go through the material experiences. We suffer when we have the temptations inside of us, when we struggle with our lack of, lack of patience and with all the things that we each, each struggle through. But we continue wanting something better, something more, something deeper, something more profound. We will be filled the daily bread. That's why give us this day our daily bread is not just the physical nourishment for the body, but the bread of life that Christ says, I am the bread of life. Hungry and thirst, the water of the gospel that will quench the thirst forever. Do you remember that passage when he goes in the well and talks to the woman and he says, well, you're getting water from the, from the well, but I can give you a water that you will never thirst again. Water of life, of the gospel, of the good news, of these universal principles of conduct that regulate the entire universe and that one day are going to be the rule of conduct for all of us here without the stigma of religion, without the layers of any organized group. It's just going to be the universal way we interact with one another naturally. So, do you guys see the, the, the parallel between righteousness and merciful? It doesn't take away from righteousness altogether, but it goes a little further in helping us understand what he really meant about that. So the, le the next level above, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy, is the beginning of our departure from the inner work when we begin to go out into the world. And in Paul's case, it took him many years, three years in that desert that we talked about. After he leaves the desert, he goes for two more years to his hometown to face his family, to look at his relatives. And what happens when, that, when he meets them? He's completely abandoned by them. They don't want to have anything to do with him. His father publicly disinherits him before the village, before the town. They all look at him. The people who were very proud of their race and very ambitious, looking in Saul as a great champion of their tradition. Now they see a man that they think is a lunatic. They feel, poor guy, such promise. But now he's just... A... So they treat him. They treat him with the way we sometimes treat people that are on the street that, are, that have some mental issues. Oh, poor guy. That's how they treated Paul. And for two years, he works as a weaver in the mountains, crying quietly. And as he's there doing his daily job in the village, he talks to people in a very friendly way. Emmanuel says that the way Paul was interacting with people in the village guaranteed him great salary. Never, there was never any lack of work because he was so joyful. He was such a nice, kind, compassionate, caring person the way he interacted with people that he gained the trust of a lot of people. But he had not yet begun his ministry. He was just talking with people. So much so that when he finally meets Luke and he finally meets Peter and he finally goes to the church, he is so animated and enthusiastic to begin talking what happens when he first goes up to give a sermon? He couldn't. 
Now, this is a man who for his entire life as Saul gave sermons, gave preachings, was eloquent, was very articulate, was so impassioned. He could captivate, magnetize the crowds, hypnotize them. He couldn't talk. So he had to go to the very end. Those that want to be the last, those that want to be the first, be the last, serve and gain the trust and the friendship of each and every one of the followers of the way, the members of the community. As he was there in his tent, he would talk to each and every one of them to, in order to regain friendship, regain trust in that simplicity. Only then, after many years of the oasis, of the mountain, in the, as a weaver, with a lot of contemplation and introspection, he finally begins his service. So that's for us to meditate, that all of our tasks require a certain level of inner preparation that we accomplish through reading, through meditation, through prayers, through charitable work for the community. And these emotions that we have, that come up from our heart, patience, tolerance, forgiveness, spontaneity, joy, optimism, enthusiasm. It's one of my favorite words in the English language, enthusiasm. Thus comes from Theo. Theo means God in Greek. To be enthusiastic is to be filled with God. So if I'm able to awaken enthusiasm in people, I'm awakening the God inside of them. Isn't that awesome? I love that. Okay. So as we begin to the next part of the sermon, we're going to take a break because now we went for, for, through the first four that are the inner, and we'll begin the last three, which is more towards the outer. So we'll take a break and resume soon. And I'll... Thank you so much. Are we good with the mic? <coughs> okay. We have now satiated our hunger and thirst, I hope, for the body, so we can continue with the spirit, yes? All right. <laughs> We got our daily bread, our cheese bread. Okay, good. So we move on now to the last three, the external ones. Then deal now with our interaction with one another, our fellow men. Everyone's got their mouth full, they're eating, so I'll just read this one myself. <laughs> Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. This equates in the Our Father to thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven so if we meditate on these two together thy will be done how is the will of god is merciful i'm gonna put my water here because i just became self-conscious that i'm holding it the will of god is always merciful right mm -hmm. our prehistoric, long notions of a punishing God, a God that condemns. Has anyone seen the movie The Cabin, The Shack? Okay, here is a great movie recommendation. The book is incredible. It's very beautiful. If you want to read the book, I recommend the book. But if you don't have a lot of time, or if you're like me, you have a pile of books in your nightstand that you still have to go through, then watch the movie. Because the movie talks a lot about a true story that happened with a man in Seattle in the early 90s who has a sort of out-of-body experience over a weekend. And he has some incredible insights and changes his life as a result of it. And his friend writes this book of his account, becomes a worldwide bestseller. But the reason I'm mentioning this is because in the book or in the movie, in his story, there's a lot of interactions with God and this notion that God is all loving, all merciful, never punishes, never condemns. This whole notion of hell becomes completely obsolete. So, blessed are the merciful, though, ha, fortunate are those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. As we explored from the previous Beatitude, is the ability to discern that no matter what's right or what's wrong, what's fair, what's unfair in a situation, I will let my compassion, my mercy, my clemency override it and just extend that love to people, no matter what. 
That's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, operates like that. And that's how His will is done on earth. When we pray, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we're asking for this kingdom of God, for these values, for this way to interact with one another, to descend upon the earth so that it becomes the only way we interact with one another, extending that grace. And I put this uh, vi vi uh, visual here because it's a description of a parable. Who wants to guess which parable this image is expressing? Not the prodigal son. Which one? Not that one. That's for the Good Samaritan, I think, where the, if they, somebody asks you to walk a thousand steps, walk two, two miles. Somebody asks for your cloak, give them your, your robe as well. No, this one is the parable of the wedding feast. When in the party, there is one in the celebration, the wedding banquet. Wedding is an alliance. An alliance is a unification of the... Christ within us with our spirits. That's really what that wedding feast represents. To be united with God in our hearts, one with God. When we are like that, we are merciful. We act the way God would act in any situation. And we begin to wear this nuptial tunic, meaning we begin to really embody the teachings and act from those teachings naturally to the point where our perispiritual body is resembling already this wedding tunic. Why this wedding tunic? This tunic of unification, this alliance, this communion with God. So when we're here in this beatitude, we are already in that state. And by the way, we don't have to, like we said, go through all the four ones previously to only then get to this one. We can achieve this one too. It's just how we practice it. And the order that we achieve them doesn't matter. As long as we're doing the work, our goodwill, our good intentions are there every day. As Paul says, if we're fighting the good fight, that's all that the spirit world is, expects of us and wants of us. Now, this one is one of my favorite. Who wants to read this one? Kirsten. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Thank you. Hallowed be thy name. So this one really ties with the children. Remember when he says, if you want to receive the kingdom of heaven, then be like the children. Otherwise, you can't enter into it. I love this image because it, gives an idea of the transparency when there are no longer any spots, any dirt. That's the work we do within ourselves to cleanse, to purify our minds, our hearts from any impurities, from anything that still has detritus, things that are totally attached to matter, to material values. When we no longer have that, our hearts are pure. Or as Pastorino says, they're cleansed purified. It's like an actual work of sweeping. When that happens, we see God. So fortunate are those of us that have become pure in heart, because in those moments we see God. What do they mean by that? Or what does Christ mean by that? Do we see God? Like, does God appear in front of us? No. We connect and when we are in this state, we see God in you, I see God in you, I see God in that situation. I see God in absolutely everyone and absolutely everything. For a person that's pure of heart, there is no darkness, there is no evil, there is nothing that is not divine, that is not sublime. Now imagine if all of us, it's not if, imagine when all of us, can walk around and interact with one another with this purity of heart. There won't be any wars. There won't be any disagreements. 
because it's the purity, it's that childlike spontaneity, that innocence, that simple joy. That's why I, I chose to put this picture again to remind us of that. That simplicity of the children, or they shall see God. And he says, hallowed be thy name. What is hallowed? It's something that's sanctified, something that has become pure. After a lot of filtering, a lot of distilling, a whole process of cleaning, gets finally hallowed, gets sanctified. And what's very beautiful is that the crown part, the last one of the seventh Beatitudes, is blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. So, whereas being pure of heart, we see God in everything and everyone, when we achieve a level of peacemaker, we are children of God. In what sense? Everybody is God's children, correct? But to be children of God in this sense is to act God-like. I will act God-like in every situation of my life. How would God act in this moment? Being merciful, being pure of heart, being a peacemaker, which is different from being meek and peace-loving. Remember the third beatitude? Blessed are the meek and peace-loving, for they shall possess the earth, inherit the earth. Remember that one? That was the emotional autonomy, emotional self-control. The peace dwells in me. I am sovereign. All the animals around me are appeased. The inner Christ is born. Now, I am strong enough, wise enough, mature enough to extend that and awaken peace in others. Now we see people, for example, like Chico Xavier, his mere presence in the room would awaken peace in people. He didn't even have to open his mouth. Just his presence would radiate, glow. People were like, oh, I feel peaceful. Not just people like Chico, not necessarily saintly people, but people in all departments of life, all sectors of society. There are entrepreneurs, there are CEOs that are able to be peacemakers. I've actually interacted with one who's not a CEO, nobody famous, but is a person who has their own business, has been doing it for 25 years very well. This man has the ability to cause peace just by talking because he's so spontaneous. He, there, you can sense that there is very little ego that there is an emotional self-control, that there is a detachment to shallow things, trivial things, and a, 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 such a wholesome focus on what's truly essential that he naturally conveys that to people. And by being in his presence, I notice that I begin to talk slower. My body gets more relaxed. I'm more grounded. I'm more present. He's, he's talking, we're talking about business. We're not talking about anything related to spirituality, just business. But the energy behind that spirit's words have achieved such a level of spiritual maturity that he awakens peace in others. So when we begin to act in that way, am I able to cause peace in others? Then we're going to be acting God-like. And to act God-like, we will be called children of God co-workers with God. We can definitely recognize the source. As the opening of the gospel today said, you'll recognize the tree by the fruits that it bears. A good tree produces good fruits. So the children of God will be able to recognize the sublimity, the beauty, the, the mercy of God in those people, in their actions. And that's the last beatitude up on top of the hill, so to speak, and the opening of the Our Father prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven. I love this uh, collective feeling that Christ evokes because when He gives the Our Father recommendation in the Gospels, He's teaching the apostles and the people there are listening to Him how to pray. And do you remember the recommendation that Christ gives just before He begins to recite the Our Father prayer? He says, but when you pray, don't do it in the public squares so that you can be applauded by the people. 
But instead, go into your room and with the door locked, address your father who sees in secret. And before you even ask, the father already knows what you want. So I think to myself, okay, if that's how I need to go into my room mentally, emotionally, with myself, in order to then begin talking to God, why do I have to talk in the third person? Our Father. Why is it not my Father? The whole Our Father prayer is us. And that is a sublime teaching in and of itself. Nobody is isolated. None of us are disconnected. We're all in the same boat, rowing it together. That's why he starts to pray saying, Our Father. It gives us a feeling of community. And the feeling of community is so crucial to our happiness. Who has seen the documentary from Netflix? It's on Netflix called Happy. You guys saw it, all of you? Do you remember one of the most crucial drivers behind increasing the level of happiness in people, what it is? It's a feeling of community, a feeling of belonging to something, to something meaningful. That feeling of community is what connects us. So when we say, our Father, whatever I'm going through in that moment, before I begin the prayer, I'm going to be reminded that I'm not alone, that all of us are in this together, and I'm going to address Him as, or her, or whatever, God, as our Creator, our Father. Then suddenly I feel like I'm a part of this, that I'm not alone. So that's the journey of the Beatitudes, the seven. And as Pastorino analyzes this, the last two, as you will see, are mere consequences of acting in the public, of what can happen. And he says, fortunate are those, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, because of that thirst for perfection. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. And this was so interpreted as because of me being a Christian label, follower of a man who wants to save everybody from hell. And now that we've seen this from the point of view of spiritism, is the Christ of the planet. It involves absolutely every single inhabitant on this planet, whether they know about it or not. And it doesn't have any label of religion or spirituality. It doesn't have any of that. It's a conduct, a way of conduct. Persecute and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Let's remember Paul. Paul, throughout his whole ministry, how many times was he arrested? How many times was he persecuted? How many times was he whipped and stoned? And every time he went through it, he rejoiced. He was grateful. He was ecstatic because he understood that those moments were moments for him to bear witness. He says it all the time in the book. I'm now going to bear witness. Peter, let us bear witness. Exemplify. This is when the crowd is seeing. And when we are exemplifying the teachings of Christ in our own lives, we're being watched, we're being observed, we're being carefully scrutinized by those incarnate and discarnate who truly want to see if what we read and what we study is actually practiced in reality. And those are actually what we call, what I like to call, and a friend of ours at Inner Enlightenment likes to call, the spiritual personal trainer, the spiritual gym, those people that are us also in so certain situations that want to press our buttons and trigger us and test us so that we can bear witness and exemplify if we're truly patient, if we are truly merciful, if we're truly being forgiven. And if not, if we fail, no harm done, no need for punishment. Let's dust ourselves off, get up and try again. And the more we get up and try again, the more courageous, the more 
the more experienced, the stronger we become, the better we're going to be able to let this new man be born in us and be able to be a better instrument. I put this uh, image here of the circus and the martyrdom that the Christians endured for 300 years because this is such an important part of history. The followers of the way, as they were called in the very beginning, Luke, the Apostle Luke, the doctor, was the one that suggested, why don't you guys call yourselves Christians? Because the followers of the way, there are many ways. Some ways don't lead to some good places. So why don't you call yourself followers of Christ, Christians? So that was a label that he suggested and they adopted. And the followers of the Christ or the carpenter, as they were known, the Nazarene carpenter, endured the ultimate sacrifice. Who knows how many thousands of spirits were able to bear witness in such a powerful way in order to give their lives in a moment that served as a spectacle for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of spirits to observe what's happening and reflect what is moving these people. What faith do they have? What's animating them to be able to courageously walk out there and sing a lot of historical accounts of the, part of the audience members show that many of them saw lights, they saw angels, they, could, they had spiritual visions of something that was happening that they couldn't comprehend. We begin to see the importance of these horrible spectacles because these spirits who came for that mission, who were already ready, I believe, with all of the Beatitudes in the sermon to be able to exemplify such a powerful, go through such a powerful sacrifice. So when we see those last two Beatitudes, fortunate are you when you are persecuted because of righteousness, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Fortunate are you when others insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Fortunately, we've evolved that we don't have these circuses anymore. But Paul nonetheless does say we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses all the time. Who are those? Those are the spirits. Our brothers and sisters in the discarnate world that are observing our behavior. And they want to learn from us. Now, we can be an example of peacemaking. We can be an example of mercy. And when we do those things, we also captivate. We also touch their hearts. We also inspire them. It's what um, in the book, The Little Prince, um, ex 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 uh, how do you say his name? Oh, Exupéry. Exupéry says, you are responsible for those that you captivate. You are responsible for those that you captivate. What does that mean, responsible? Not responsible in a burdensome way, but responsible in a way of, wow, I suddenly have a sphere of influence of people that are observing me, looking up to me, and admiring me. This gives me further enthusiasm, further determination, and further commitment to my own personal transformation so that I can be a source of inspiration for those people as well. And we don't realize how many people we affect in our lives. How many people we can awaken peace inside of them, especially today when technology allows us to be a very powerful ripple effect, sphere of influence to the entire planet. How many of us post things on Facebook and social media? How much power can those posts have to heal people, to uplift people, to get at a moment when somebody had to read something and they are overcome and they are reconnected again with joy, with enthusiasm. So that responsibility is something that we have access to today. And I think we are reaching that point of the planet of regeneration, which Spiritism and the Consoler is helping to pave the way of the very beginnings by finally removing, as Kardec says, there is no central authorities, there is no dogmas, there is no hierarchies. Everyone can be a source of these teachings, of these revelations. The first revelation of Moses was something circumscribed for a mi by a minority for a minority. And that as it grows into the teachings of Christ, the second revelation, it evolves from something being done by minorities before majorities. 
And finally, we come to a moment in the third revelation, the new planet, where this, these teachings, this conduct, these revelations is available by the majority, for the majority. So there's no need to be hidden, to have rituals, to have mysticism, to have the esoteric practices. It's clear, clear as day, appeals to our reason, our common sense. And he concludes by saying, rejoice, be glad. Remember the children dancing with Christ? That kind of joy, that kind of happiness. For great is your reward in heaven. And this is also translated in some um, versions as great is your grace in heaven. That free joy, grace comes from free as well, gratis. So grace comes with mercy. Even though we may not have merit yet to earn something, we are given many times by God. So this is just the uh, comparison of the Our Father on one side and the Beatitudes on the other side. So you can see how it ties. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name going up and each Beatitude that corresponds with it. And also how it can connect. This is just suggestions. This is not the only way, of course. How it can connect with our different centers of force. Temptation and deliverance from evil, our basic chakra. Forgive us our trespasses, this center of force, which is the more powerful emotions. Our daily bread, the region where we consume our nourishments. Thy will be done in the heart. Holy name, when we speak, and our Father in heaven. So the higher centers of force that are more connected to the higher spirituality. So, we can do one or two things. We can go into questions and answer now, and then I can play music in the end, or I can play music now and we go to questions and answer. Music in the end. Okay. So let's have questions. So thank you again, Fred, um, mm -hmm. for this finalizing this uh, part. Questions, comments, please. Yes. Yeah, about the uh, those uh, the one that you present before, which was thirsty hunger and thirst for the righteousness, versus the merciful, to be mer merciful. Yeah, this against the previous one. <clears throat> so if you take righteousness as justice. Um, I, I asked this question in the last symposium because it was presented that the divine justice is full of mercy. Yes. While the human justice, mercy has no place. Otherwise, you won't be just. Right. So it seems a contradiction there. Right. But I think I may have something I, don't, I want first to know your your opinion and see if our human justice that is getting wrong. <laughs> I think our human justice is evolving to equate divine justice in the future. We're progressing in that direction. But for be now, to be, merciful. to be merciful. But for now, we're much more on eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth justice rather than mercy, which basically overlooks the faults, extends compassion, despite how horrible it, it may have been, the fault, it doesn't matter. The mercy will come and cover the multitude of sins. As Peter says, love covers the multitude of sins. So our, our human justice is going to more and more get to that direction. So, Thank you. We have a question actually from the web. Ooh from our little chat area here. This is from Dustin. Do you all believe that Jesus wants us to become perfect or do you believe we are saved through faith alone? I believe that when Jesus says, be perfect like your Father who is in heaven is perfect, I believe he's expecting us to do that work, that he entrusts us with the capability to do that work ourselves. Otherwise, I don't think there's much source of rejoicing and personal 
uh, sense of satisfaction if all of that effort is done by a third party and I just suddenly magically am saved. Absolutely that the faith is a huge part of the process because the faith is to be able to hope, to be able to persevere even though we may not see it, even though we may not understand a lot of the time. But I, I, do, ex I do think that Jesus is, expects this from all of us. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> I was just reminded of a short little thing that the Dalai Lama said when you were showing the Christians being persecuted and also your beautiful emphasis on peace in the heart, which is really our goal. So the Dalai Lama was talking to a friend of his, a monk who had been imprisoned by the Chinese for 13 years or 11 wow. years, something like that. So the monk said to the Dalai Lama, I had a couple of dangerous times. And the Dalai Lama responds, oh, you were almost killed. He said, no, I almost lost my compassion for the Chinese. Wow. Yeah. wow. That's almost, almost lost my compassion. Yeah. Wow, beautiful. Very insightful, thank you. Anyone else? Anyone comments, questions? Kirsten. I have a comment. This was wonderful. The time passed by very fast. Um, no, I just wanted to say thank you. This has thank been you. truly beautiful, and it's always a pleasure to have you here, Fred. Thank you so much for thank donating you. your time mm -hmm. and for bringing your brother, the violin, with you and sharing him with us. I am the official carrier of the violin, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the violin has a right. <laughs> we, have still, we still have a couple more minutes if you would like to ask a question or comment. Yasko. Yasko. Yeah, so in another piece uh, of this justice, I don't know, um, I don't know who was, if it was Haroldo, one of those that are judge. Uh, I think he said that uh, the, our justice actually, um, it was supposed to be um, opportunity to redo it, to learn, to re, how to say? Reevaluate. Reevaluate and to reconnect with the good, but unfortunately, our our justice prison system don't allow this. You know, it, it forgot the part of educational. Yeah. So I think it meant to be a good favor that you're doing by condemning. Say, look, I'm gonna get you out of the street, give you opportunity to Rehabilitate. Learn, rehabilitate, yeah. rehabilitate to learn, because our system is perfect to give you this chance, unfortunately. You well, see? Yes, well, you see that, I think you look, if we look at the positive growth, there are some countries in Europe that are basically, all their prisons are obsolete. The buildings where it used to be pre prisons, they have to find other purposes for them. I think in Amsterdam and the Netherlands, and I think in another Scandinavian country, the majority of the prisons in those countries are obsolete because there are no more inmates. Because they've, un they've been able to implement exactly what you're saying, a place for rehabilitation. And Julio Carvalho does a work with inmates, and he gave a lecture a long time ago at SGNY, and he said, that a survey was conducted of inmates and the number one thing overwhelmingly when you ask inmates if you could do one thing if you could have one wish granted for you what would it be the number one response if I had a chance to do it again I would love a chance to be able to do it over I would love to have a second chance and that's when reincarnation as a concept comes in so beautifully how can the Father be merciful if He doesn't give us a second chance? If all we get is one chance and then that's it, right? And I wonder sometimes, we make a lot of analogies about the planet Earth and our reincarnation as a school. 
And as we progress from one grade to another grade in certain subjects, we may get an A. Next time, we may get a C, we may get a D. Sometimes we have to do summer school. Sometimes we have to repeat the grade. But we constantly progress. And I, I, I remember one day at, at our center, we were having a study group. And we started thinking about this analogy. Imagine if we had like a kindergarten class. Children, being children, acting out, breaking things, running around, being crazy. And you have the teachers there that are trying to put to calm them down, to put order. Now, they act one way. Now imagine if you had told the kids that the teacher and the parents, everybody that they love, they're not gonna be in the room, but they're gonna be in a room next door, and they're gonna watch everything that you're gonna do. How would we think that the children would act in that way versus in the regular scenario? Would the behavior of the children perhaps change if they all knew that the people they love the most, that love them the most, that care for them the most, are all watching and cheering them on and giving them emotional mental support in the room next door? Wouldn't they act perhaps a little better? Now imagine if all of us incarnates had this understanding that God and all of our good spirits, our family members, our loved ones from pre previous lives, there's a chance that many of them are actually there watching us, giving us support, cheering us on. Wouldn't we act in a much better way out of a sense of responsibility and out of a sense of awareness that they were there watching us, right? So I think this will become more and more of a reality as we evolve to the planet of regeneration and as we do we naturally will behave that way so oh fred we have uh, two two questions from the web yes. uh one is a follow-up from earlier from okay, the from same uh, young man dustin he says so do they believe we can stop sinning completely so his original question was do you all believe that jesus wants us to become perfect or do you believe we are saved through faith alone and the follow-up question was, so do they believe we can stop sinning completely? Well, in that passage when Christ says, be, be perfect like your Father who is in heaven is perfect, He is giving us an answer right there that yes, ultimately, eventually, we will achieve that nuptial tunic of the parable of the wedding feast, be in full communion, one with God, completely unified in our hearts and minds, where the sin will not even be considered a sin. Just like temptation is only a temptation if it tempts us. Some people can go through uh, a room full of drug addicts and not have any reaction to it because that's not a temptation for them. Somebody else can go through that same room and get completely emotionally rattled because that's a temptation for them. So the same way that forgiveness is only for those who feel insulted. When we no longer feel insulted, we don't even have to forgive anymore. The same idea, I think, for sinning will, will ultimately be for us. We no longer will be in that state because sin will be such a far-removed understanding. Uh, he has a follow-up comment. And if we stop sinning, is it possible for me to do it in this life? I just heard him mention reincarnation, so I'm excited to hear the answer. Sorry for the questions. I just want to know the truth. And he's talking about things I don't hear others mention that I myself have seen in the Bible. I'm glad, Dustin, he's engaging with us. So, it, the, can so you his question this? is, yes. Yeah, so, and if we can stop sinning, is it possible for me to do it in this life? So, yes, it is. I mean, I think you can ask this both ways. If it's possible for me to stop sinning ultimately, can I for now indulge and enjoy and eventually I'll stop sinning? Well, there's every action, there's a reaction. Every cause, there's a consequence to it. It's much easier for us to be able to stop ourselves from succumbing to the first temptation than to stop after many, many times conditioning ourselves into a habit of falling into the same thing be it a behavior of, of lust, of consuming things that are bad for us, or gossiping. Mm -hmm. it, it applies to everything. So if we can exercise 
prayer and be watchful. As Christ says, watch and pray. Keep that sentinel of our conscience awake. Not fall asleep spiritually. When Christ is in the garden and he's in agony and he's suffering, he's about to be captured by the guards. His disciples are there. What are they doing? They're sleeping. They can't stay awake. And he says, can't you keep awake or, or watchful just for one more hour with me? That's symbolic that they're not being watchful. They're not allowing themselves to stay in prayer and awake. They let the flesh be stronger. That's when he says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So the flesh is weak and it can be a source for our sins, but only if we allow the flesh to be stronger than our spirit. So we can spiritualize matter every day when we wake up. We can spiritualize matter, and that's what we do with this planet. Or we can animalize our spirit. It's our choice. We can spiritualize matter, or we can animalize our spirit. In other words, let matter animalize us. So from someone else, uh, there's a question. Um, Adelius Paulo, looks like probably from Brazil. If we are all evolving, why does it look like, why is it so confusing on our planet? I think what he means to ask is why does it seem otherwise if we're all evolving or progressing forward, why does it seem otherwise on our planet? I think you guys may agree with me. I think it's the first time in the history of humanity where we actually have instant access to everything that's happening in the world at the same time. Things were much worse in the Middle Ages, but nobody had YouTube or the internet to find out what was happening in the village down the road. So we are bombarded by so much information at the same time that gives us the perception that things are worse, but they're not. Never in the history of humanity has there been more philanthropic work, corporate responsibility, nonprofit organizations. I mean, this is thriving in a way that has never occurred in the past. So, and that's not in the media. That's, that doesn't sell as much as bad news. So we're definitely evolving. Give one more chance for one final comment, one final. Out, Barbara. Thank you, Fred. This is beautiful. We were excited just by the title, The Sermon of the Mount, <laughs> because it's very poetic, yeah, right? Yeah. It's very, it's poetry. Uh, I was thinking in, in, in the youth, young, young audience, right? And how they, they like things to be quick. So I was trying to summarize the Beatitudes somehow, like a, if we need to tell, to text somebody or to tweet or the Beatitudes to a young person, what will we put? Uh, and this is not, it's not a question for you, it's just, Because I'm <laughs> don't not a worry. young person. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, you're, oh, let me tell you, your spirit is very young, youthful. Uh, and I, I, I think we, we may summarize by, by the love, by love, right? Love God, love yourself, love your neighbor. Yeah. I, I'm, I don't yeah. know if you said. What'd you say? <laughs> what did Leo say? I don't know. <laughs> say it. <laughs> we are immortal. You are immortal, yeah. We're immortal. I'm ju just, it's just a, a yeah, I mean, I'm, look, I'm talking the, the, and I'm, this sermon, Meditating, right? and this sermon has so many deeper layers of insights that we are not even able to comprehend yet. And people like Gandhi comprehended because he famously said, if all the books were burned and all there was left was the Sermon of the Mountain, we could start over. We would be okay. Nothing would have been lost. Now, I get the Sermon of the Mountain to a certain extent. I, I appreciate its beauty and its insights, but I don't yet comprehend how valuable it is the way Gandhi did in order to make that kind of statement. So as, we, as our awareness deepens and our spiritual perception refines, we're going to get more and more layers out of this that we still don't even have the ability yet, you know? So let's be optimistic. <laughs> Well, I know, as Kirsten said, it went by so quickly, mm -hmm. but we would like to thank Fred again thank for you. all of this. Um, what we um, propose right now, 
100%. Still 100%. Don't interrupt me. No. <laughs> um, what we would like to propose now is that as he's playing, that we receive this as our passes. We usually have our passes on Saturdays. Uh, because of the arrangement and everything, we're not going to um, give the, um, have the passes tonight. But make this the moment that we're receiving the passes. Connect. We're going to dim the light. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay. Yeah. We will dim the light as well. Um, if we can put on the first... Actually, the first there's this, which is the end. Okay, perfect. That's that's awesome. Um, and let us really connect with our mentors, the mentors of this house. Of this house. Um, Kirsten will then uh, come and um, say the final prayer. Um, so we then can open up a little bit more. We still have a couple. We still definitely have a couple more minutes. You can pick his brain. Don't pick yes. mine. Pick his. Because <laughs> he studied. <laughs> and we'll close the even that way. Okay. And before I play, just want to give you a little bit of context of what I'm going to play. Good. I'm, I put this medley together of two songs. One is a melody from the soundtrack of this movie, The Mission. Who here has seen the movie The Mission? Raise your hand, please. The Mission. Robert De Niro, Jeremy Irons. Guys, this is a masterpiece. It's an epic movie from 1986. It's on Amazon. It's on Netflix. If you haven't seen it, watch. It's a true story that takes place in Brazil, Argentina, in the border, about Jesuit missionaries that go to uh, establish missions to the Native Americans and their struggle with keeping the mission alive with the interests of the Crown and the Vatican. So what's powerful in this movie is the song. And one of the priests who actually is able to survive and build the first mission only survives because he plays the oboe. And he plays this very haunting, magical, captivating melody, which is the melody that you're going to hear. So as we... Uh, meditate and prepare, I want us to think of these two worlds, the manger of the Christ being born in, within us, surrounded by the appeased, the calm, the tranquil animals, this melody of the movie, and then it will go directly into this by Charlie Chaplin, the song Smile, which I think is a wonderful expression of the Sermon of the Mountain journey the struggle of going up the hill, of having the new man be born out of the old man, and the lyrics, they capture that. So I will leave, I will ask if you don't mind, Leo, when I give you a sign, if you could go to the next slide for me, because there's two songs, so, and you can dim the lights if you want. Not yet, not yet. Thank you. 